Hello and welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Energy Podcast. My name is trainer Chip Ritchie. I am joined, as always, by my co-host Azul GG, and we've got a ton to talk about this week. We'll be talking a little bit about cheating in the Pokemon TCG. It's been a hot topic the past week or so, so we'll be talking about cheating, gameplay errors, how those things are defined by Pokemon, and how you can best look out for an opponent who may be trying to take advantage of a situation in one of your games. A little bit of an update around LAIC, the Latin American International Championships. We've got a date, but not much more info besides that when it comes to the travel awards and stipends, so we'll talk about that a little bit. We've, of course, got some tournament results to look at, the Champions League Events that happened in Yokohama, Japan, the Singapore Regional League tournament that happened over in Singapore. These events did have Lost Origin legal, and they certainly will have an impact on the Peoria Regional Championships, which are happening this coming weekend. We'll, of course, have Guess That Flavor Text, everyone's favorite segment. And then we will be doing a meta forecast for the Peoria Regional Championships, giving our thoughts on some of the top decks, the new cards, the new archetypes, and how all these other events that have already happened in other parts of the world will impact the tournament this weekend. Lots to talk about, Azul. Plenty to go on. But before we get into it, what's going on, man? How you doing? How's your week been? <laughs> doing pretty good. Uh, I am uh, up north uh, in the Midwest for a wedding, and I'm staying here for the week until Peoria Regional is coming up this weekend. Um, so a little bit uh, lack on the content as far as my YouTube and stream go. Um, so getting kind of a little bit of a break weekend, I guess. Grinding a lot of Pokemon leading up to the, the regional championships, though. So I'm still working uh, and still being able to do some uh, coaching remotely as well. So keeping up with uh, keeping up with all that. But uh, yeah, been having a, a ton of fun playing with the new cards. And um, yeah, looking forward to the first tournament with, uh, with Lost Origins. How about you, Chip? It's Lost Origin. Once again, let's not Lost forget. Origin. Lost Origin. <laughs> You'll get it right hey, one of these a, days. There was, a, I saw a tweet, uh, one of the PTCG or PTCG, I think it was PTCG Live. Uh, whoever posts in the forums, they mess it up too. They put Lost Origins instead of Lost Origin when they were like, it's going to be released. Oh, Are, whenever. We Are we surprised though? Are we surprised? Well, no. It's so hard because like, why would you, <laughs> like, it feels like it shouldn't stop. You shouldn't say, lost origin it feels like there should it should say lost origins but it is the it's, singular origin the origin of yeah of all right so there's only one origin i guess right? maybe i don't uh, know yeah, yeah. but my week's been pretty good uh, <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> uh this past weekend baby sam became one month old they grow up so fast but uh <laughs> Yeah, it's been a good, really kind of an uneventful week, to be honest, besides that, which has been nice, uh, just kind of relaxing, getting into the swing of parenting life and, uh, you know, getting back home after traveling last weekend or the previous weekend, I guess, to that to Baltimore and just chilling um, until, you know, whatever else we got going on through the rest of the season. But let's go ahead and kick it off with our first topic today, which is cheating in the Pokemon TCG. Now, this is something that's come up big time. We talked about a couple of different things on last week's episode of issues that occurred on the live stream. After our episode aired, there was more and more things that came out. It really was, it seemed like every single day this week on Pokemon TCG Twitter, there was some new big thing that was happening that people were talking about in regards to cheating and um, gameplay errors and all those things going on. So we just wanted to spend a little bit of time in this episode talking about cheating in card games, how people try to do it, um, and also how it is defined by Pokemon, maybe the difference between making a gameplay error and cheating. This is something Azul and I have talked about on the podcast before, but it is definitely a prevalent issue right now, so we wanted to just bring it up again. And uh, we'll also talk about, you know, if you are worried that your opponent may be cheating, what are some ways that you can try to prevent that and mitigate that, um, or what you should do in those situations if you believe foul play is afoot. So... Azul, difference between gameplay errors and cheating. Why don't you break it down for us? Yeah, so there is a difference, and I'll go a little bit more in depth on to I'll go on like a little bit of a, a rant here in a second about <laughs> like my my overall thoughts on like how the community currently perceives you know cheating versus uh, uh, I guess I mean they're both gameplay errors like a mistake versus cheating. So um, 
they both involve making an error in the game, right? Like attaching a second energy card when you can't or playing a second supporter, um, something like that. Uh, but the difference is cheating implies that there's malicious intent. You, you played the second supporter on purpose, right? Like you went out of your way to be like, I've already played a supporter for turn, but if I can get away with playing a second supporter for turn, I'm going to try and do that. Whereas a mistake would be like, I played a research and then you play out the rest of your turn and you're like, uh, boss's orders is really good right here. I'm going to go boss cat that Pokemon. It's like, all right, I'm going to play this boss as well. And then your opponent's like, whoa, you can't do that. You played research. You're like, oh, you're right. I already played research. All right, boss back, continue game, right? You just messed up. You made a mistake. And sometimes the board state does progress too far past of being like, whoa, you, you can't do that. Sometimes you're like, play a research, uh, play a, I don't know, an Avery, play a bunch of cards. And then your opponent's like, wait, you just played two supporters three actions ago. And then the game state's broken. Um, if it can't be reversed, you know, then it's probably going to be a game loss, which is fine, right? Like that's what happens. Uh, the difference is, did you play the Avery knowing you're playing a second supporter or did you just biasly play the Avery because you forgot you had already played a supporter? And that's like the, that's kind of the the line, right? There's there's making a mistake, uh, and then there's there's cheating, right? And that's the, those are the that's, that's what you have to figure out, and that's what you know. Ideally, we want none of. We don't want any cheating, but the the mistakes are always going to happen, right? People are just going to play two supporters by accident, attach two energy, or I don't know. I'm trying to think of like another one. Misput damage counters in play, or something like that, right? Those mistakes are just going to happen. Drawing extra um, cards. And, yeah, drawing extra cards. <clears throat> Those things are always going to happen. Uh, the biggest thing we want to do is just make sure that when they are happening, they're just mistakes and no one's doing them on purpose. So we wanted to take a second and just kind of go through the Pokemon uh, tournament rules handbook because it very clearly outlines a lot of different scenarios and situations and how penalties are assessed in these various situations. So I'll just read through all of these. It is on page 49 of the... Uh, Pokemon Tournament Rules Handbook. You can just Google this. It is publicly available for anyone to see. And most judges are pretty familiar with this, the guidelines here and everything going on. Um, so this is under section 7.3.2.1, gameplay error. TCG gameplay errors are so-called because they are infractions committed during the context of a game in progress. They often come about because of a missed or ill-executed ex game mechanic. Minor gameplay errors have little to no effect on the progress of the game and can be fixed or rerouted completely with little effort. Many genuine mistakes made during a TCG match begin life as a minor gameplay error, and they may be reclassified as major if they are not caught and rectified immediately. Examples may include putting a card into the hand without revealing it to the opponent when it affects specifies you must do so, so maybe playing a quick ball or ultra ball and putting that card into your hand right away before revealing it, declaring an attack without having the required energy attached, or failing to set up prize cards at the beginning of the game. So these are all minor gameplay errors. And the recommended starting penalty for a minor gameplay error, as outlined in the guidebook, is a warning. So you would not, while a warning is a penalty, you're not getting, you know, super penalized in terms of a double prize card loss immediately. Now, what I will say is at regional championships, whenever a warning is issued, it is documented. And so if someone was to receive multiple warnings for trying to do these things multiple times, like not revealing the Pokemon they took off quick ball multiple times through the course of an event, eventually these penalties would get escalated up to a major, which would be double prize card loss, something like that. Any thoughts you want to interject, Azul, before I go on to the major uh, gameplay errors i think with you bringing that up i this is a there was a tweet from stefan that i did want to bring up i think this would be a perfect time to bring that up actually so i'll read stefan's uh because i had kind of a different perspective on this until stefan made this tweet and i do definitely agree with stefan uh after he made this tweet and i kind of read it um so stefan made this tweet before baltimore regionals i think and i'll just read through the whole thread real fast here from stefan um, here we go. Uh, since it's the start of the season, here's a reminder for both new and returning players. Don't be afraid to call a judge. I've decided to do it more often this season, and here's why, and why I encourage you to do so as well. Say your opponent tries to attach an energy, but they already attached one this turn. You catch it. Sorry, my bad. They say, no problem. You think 
uh, you think and don't call a judge, it's likely that it was just an honest mistake. Everyone gets nervous. But if no one calls a judge in this situation, then someone who wants to cheat could try attaching an extra energy sometimes. If they get caught, since you don't call a judge, they get no penalty. If they don't get caught, free energy. So they're likely to try. <clears throat> so they're more likely to try. By calling a judge, you help protect the community, including yourself, from a cheater. Uh, from cheaters, if your opponent made an honest mistake, they'll get a warning. If it turns out they've tried the same thing the last three rounds, they'll get penalized. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense, right? Yes. Um, but judges can all, uh, but judges can only know that a player tried to attach an every attach an energy every round if their opponents notify them when it happens. So don't be afraid to call a judge if anything happens. Extra draw, mulligan with a basic in hand, etc., including uh, versus well-known players. It doesn't mean you're accusing your opponent. Of cheating it's a way to protect yourself and your fellow players i haven't done it enough in the past but i want to correct that so um in the past i kind of disagreed with this take initially because i always was kind of like well if the players can just resolve it amongst themselves i'm not trying to get get my opponent any kind of penalties for you know them by actually attaching an extra energy if i catch it immediately but i think there is some there's there is some uh value to doing what stefan says for sure and i think i will start to do that as well um, i'm not going to call a judge if my opponent ever sees an extra card or draws an extra card if i can identify the card um and i trust uh and i trust that my opponent didn't try and like move the card around or whatever because that would lead to a two prize penalty and you can't uh you can't decline a prize penalty. Correct. So because you can't decline a prize penalty, if you think your opponent very much mistakenly drew an extra card or saw the top card of their deck, if you do draw over, call over a judge in that situation, they will be penalized. And I'm trying to beat my opponent in a game of Pokemon, right? So if I think they honestly um, had the mis made the mistake of drawing an extra card and I can identify that card in their head, if they drew six off of Marty, eight off of Research, if I can be like, nope, you drew an eighth card, that's it, put on top of your deck. I'm not going to call over a judge. I don't want a two-prize penalty. If they did it like four or five times throughout a match, I would probably call over a judge. Um, but I do think for stuff like stuff like double attachments or if they go to play a second supporter, I think I agree with Stefan where it's like, um, normally I wouldn't call over a judge in those situations. I would just be like, well, you can't do that, put it back in your hand, right? Um, but I think I will start calling over a judge for those situations because if they are trying to do it every single round, it'll the, the it'll get documented and just kind of built up to the point where they will get that penalty that fifth, sixth time, right? So for those kind of situations, because those will just lead to warnings, uh, unless you have a lot of them, which at that point you should be penalti penalized, I think I will start calling over a judge for sure in, uh, in those situations. I don't think if my opponent sees an extra card, though, I'm still not going to call over a judge in those situations just because... I just don't want, I don't want to get it. I don't want a two prize. I don't need two prize cards to try and beat my opponent in a game of Pokemon, right? Like I'm sitting there to try and beat them in a game of Pokemon. So uh, I definitely want I mean, to share that tweet because it definitely changed my perspective. But of going on with that though, is it not kind of the same thing to call over a judge and bring attention to that? Like you're going to be vigilant and notice if your opponent draws an eighth card off research, but not everyone maybe will be. Should you not call over, bring attention to that? And so maybe you pointing it out. Um, Cause like I, I would say 99% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, if someone draws a seventh card off or eighth card off research or uh sixth or fifth card off Marnie, depending on which end of it you're on 99.9% .9 of the time, it is a mistake. It happens. It definitely happens. Yeah. I've done it. You've done it. It's, it's going to happen. Right. Um, But people can, abuse the fact that now you know especially now you said literally just saying this on the <laughs> podcast you know Everybody theoretically could history. someone not just try to sneak in an extra card and uh take advantage of the fact that you don't want to call a judge um and it's like okay no harm no foul Azul caught me i'm gonna put it back but oh maybe he doesn't <laughs> catch me one of these times you know i think it's imp i think it is important um, to bring attention to these things because not only for the fact of anti-cheating, but also for pro, like, clean gameplay. Not yes. necessarily cheating, but people who are just, like, we should tr strive to make as few mistakes as possible, right? And if people start getting penalized for making mistakes, which is what happens if you, we'll talk about this in the major gameplay error, drawing an extra card is a major gameplay error. You do receive a two-prize penalty for that, at a regional championships, um, which can absolutely swing the flow of a game without a doubt, like massively yeah, yeah. swings the flow of the game and potentially the outcome of the game. Um, if people start getting penalized for that, they're going to start trying to play more uh, cleanly in this, not in the sense of not cheating, but cleanly in the sense of like making sure they are doing every action appropriately, which I think is good. Correct. So I do agree with that to, ex to an extent. One of the things I always like to bring up is like Pokemon isn't, uh, 
it's not like the, the Pokemon tournaments, the regional tournaments, especially because it is like harsher penalties. It's not like it's the MLB of Pokemon, right? Like Pokemon regionals are T-ball to MLB as far as the players who show up to play in these tournaments, right? So if it was just MLB, if it was just like the top 32 players from North America were playing in the North American regionals, I would be like, okay, I think that's probably fair, right? But when I'm going up against Timmy in his first regional championships and he sees an extra card, I don't want a penalty. Uh, I'm, I'm there to try and beat Timmy at Pokemon. Right? So if I think he honestly drew an extra card or saw an extra card and I can identify the card, I don't want a two prize penalty to try and beat Timmy, right? Like I want to beat them through the game of Pokemon. Like I said, if they do it three, four times throughout a match, I'm going to call a judge, right? And that's why I think there's like that penalty is too harsh, right? So if they, if they attach a second energy, go to play a second supporter and I catch it immediately, the game stays not broken. I think, I think I'm going to start calling over a judge in those situations for sure, right? But when it is just a... Uh, buy an extra card or draw an extra card because the penalty I think is too harsh for the um, for the the situation for the for the mistake. I don't want. I'm not going to call over a judge for the situation. Still, I know I know what you're saying, but and I think it's kind of just like a bad. If it was just a warning that built up into prize penalties and game losses, then I would I would do it. But I think it's just too harsh of a penalty if they buy actually see the eighth yeah. card off a of research and don't even draw it. Like two prize penalties is just so ridiculously harsh for that mistake. I, I like I get what I, I like. It does make sense to potentially call over someone uh, call over judge in that situation, but it's just such an honest mistake almost a hundred percent of the yeah. time. Like you said, like it just doesn't seem like it's just an unfair part of the game that is being played physically in real life with the the amount of mistakes humans can make right and it's interesting too because drawing an extra prize card or sorry drawing an extra card off of a researcher marnie or something like that used to just yield a warning but it i don't know if you really remember the discussions around this at the time um but it was sometime in 2017 2018 where it did eventually get changed to now you get a double prize penalty if you um see an extra card off of uh you know a card that you're not supposed to in one of the many various ways you draw cards from your deck right yeah um i was actually i think i was actually the first person to get a double prize penalty like <laughs> against you. my opponent played like two supporters at laic the year i got second. oh to receive like, like to the, be the benefactor yeah. of a... <laughs> <laughs> i think i was the first person to be a benefit it was round one laic it was the first major tournament where that rule was in effect and my opponent like played two supporters in uh in the first game on the first round of laic so um but yeah i remember i remember yeah when it when the, the discussion was initially happening uh and everything and people were like there should be and it was, the biggest thing was just trying to change up i think the ruling around seeing an extra card that was like the biggest topic of discussion it's like what should happen when that happens and they went through like a couple different iterations initially of like when you see it does it go on top or when you see it does it shuffle i think that that changed multiple times but now we're on the they see it you see it like they show it to the opponent and they put it back on top. I'm pretty sure it's maybe they shuffle. I actually don't it even shuffles. know. I, I don't call over a judge when my opponent sees an extra card. So I actually don't know the, the result of the, the penalty. It does shuffle. I am pretty sure it did used okay. to be reveal and replace, but I think it was determined that, you know, if I do something and, you know, no, I, I, you can make plays based on knowing what your top deck is going to be next turn. Or yeah, there's, you know, at certain formats, like what if, uh, what if I draw? Yeah. What if I draw um, my crowbat? I have six cards in my hand. I have a crowbat, and I know what my card on the top is. I can just dark asset for crowbat one for if one. I know it's the <laughs> the exact card I need. Right. It's a hit. Yes. So. Yeah. yeah. So there definitely is ways to abuse it and cheat around it, right? But I think the penalty is too harsh. For like like you said, ninety nine percent of the time, it's a mistake. I don't want two prize cards for free when my when 99 percent of the time that's going to happen if not almost 100 percent of the time it's happened against me it's been a mistake right so like i said if my opponent if i think i like if i think my opponent does it and you should too like you don't have to take my advice on this my thing is just i'm showing up to try and beat my game and put my opponent in a game of pokemon so my thing is like i think the penalty is way too harsh for that very easy mistake to happen uh, but if you think your opponent did it maliciously or if they do it you know three to four times in a match at some point you should call over a judge you know if it happens like a third time you should probably be like all right i'm calling over a judge on this one i let the first two slide but at this point it's getting ridiculous um or if you think they were malicious with it if you think they were malicious with it then i would also call over a judge but i have yet to play against anyone who i think has ever maliciously drawn an extra card or see, by accidentally or maliciously looked at the top card of their deck so i have yet to call over a judge for someone for it but uh, i definitely could happen you know in my time playing the game for sure yeah i mean i do want to be careful on the podcast with like I don't think anyone should feel bad to call over yeah, a yeah. judge in these instances because you're well within your rights to do so. 
I guess, it, you know, maybe you let it be a read the room type of moment. Like Azul said, if he's playing against little Timmy round one at his first Pokemon tournament and he doesn't want to just like crush his dreams by, you know, <laughs> calling a judge and giving him a harsh penalty at the very beginning. Right. Like maybe make it a read the room type situation. But I think, you know, once you get into the upper rounds of tournaments, I mean, even I don't know. To me, I, I feel like a penalty making. I, I feel like we're at a point in the game where things are getting bigger. More and more people are getting into the game, and like there's so much money on the line at these events, not just at the you know prize payout level, but at like the stipends, travel awards. There's so much on the line and at stake. Um, I don't think I would ever fault anyone for calling a judge, and I would still recommend that people you know should call a judge over if their opponent. Yeah, I mean, just for the sake of, um, you know, consistency throughout the entirety of the event. Yeah, I never, I'd never fault anyone for calling. That's just kind of my take on it. Like, I feel like the penalty is too harsh for. And I don't and yeah, disagree that. Later, I mean, it is extremely it harsh. Cool. It is extremely, extremely harsh. But it is, if if abused, it is an incredibly beneficial thing. Getting an extra card is like would be broken <laughs> imagine every single card that says draw cards and you just add one more to it it would make it broken right yeah yeah now after you said that now i have to count my opponent's hand every time they play a marnie or a research at peoria now that you like brought that up now it's gonna be in the back of my head you right, brought up, it up bro you could broadcast to everyone you're not calling a judge <laughs> i'm screwed <laughs> But let's let's read back. Let's let's get back to the the guidelines here and just kind of walk through the rest of things. So that was kind of through the minor gameplay errors. Now on to major gameplay errors and major gameplay errors do result in a double prize card penalty, meaning in order to win the game, if your opponent receives a double prize card penalty, you have so like if your opponent makes a mistake, they receive a double prize card penalty. That means you have to take two less prizes to win the game. All yeah. right. Major gameplay errors result in some irreversible confusion to the game state that cannot be completely rewound or otherwise offset through corrective action. Errors that result in a player gaining illicit access to knowledge or cards that require a substantial level of involvement by a judge to rectify, or that have remained unnoticed for long enough to have influenced gameplay may be classified as major. Examples include drawing an extra card, taking a prize card without knocking out a Pokemon, or taking too many prize cards after knocking out a Pokemon, using and completing all effects of an ability when a card in play prevents its use, attaching more than one energy card in a turn without the use of an effect that allows this, failing to set up prize cards at the beginning of the game, resulting in potential access to six additional cards throughout one or two deck searches. So those are the examples that they lay out for major gameplay errors which once again will result in a double prize penalty and yeah, then so yeah yeah i was gonna say yeah i mean those all make sense like when a game state is irreversible then it's like there's nothing you can do about it you just have to and if it's so bad then it just becomes a game loss at some point <laughs> if it's completely uh nothing can happen about it nothing can change and the rulings around this as well like um judges always i think have the leeway to like escalate or de-escalate penalties as they see fit which i think can be a good and bad thing it can be a read the room situation right with little timmy at their first pokemon tournament who in round seven is at table you know 382 or something right you know yeah. um who's just playing enjoying the game you know do you want to be giving that person a double prize card penalty for drawing an eighth card off research a seemingly by mistake when they have zero um issues previous to that Probably not. So I think that's a situation where people can. I, I I want to. I'm pretty sure that judges can escalate and de-escalate, but I think that can be a little bit of a confusing thing as well because it lacks consistency when that's the case. But it yeah. it also is kind of a thing where each situation is unique. So should they lack consistency, or should it just be more flat, streamlined across the board? Um, I mean probably overall i think it should be i mean they should definitely be able to escalate if you have previous penalties right right, right. Um, and one thing more i would mention this if you ever disagree with a judge's ruling you can always call the head judge um, always always call the head judge i actually made this mistake i don't know if i mentioned this but i made this mistake at worlds actually this year where me and my opponent were set up for our round um and 
I had a good start. I was going first, and then they come over to us. It was around three, I think, and they're like, you guys are going to be on stream. You're going to be the lunch break stream round. And I was like, okay, so do we just carry the game over to the stream? And the guy was like, no. And I was like, are you sure? And he was like, yes. And I was like, okay. And then we picked up, but that's not the ruling. We should have taken our game and carried it over to the stream, but I didn't call the head judge. So if I, I didn't called the head that judge, happened. Yeah, if I called the head judge, would have got to good start going first, but instead went second with a <laughs> mediocre start. So always call over the head judge if you think the ruling is wrong. I was like, I'm pretty sure this is wrong. So I was like, are you sure? They were like, yes. So I just went with it. But I should have called over the head judge because I've definitely had that happen before. And I've carried my match over to the stream, but it was a while ago. So I was like, maybe the rulings have changed. So I was like, okay, sure. I guess we have to just reset up on the stream. So always call over a head judge if you think the judge who is currently giving you a ruling is incorrect and they are not the head judge <laughs> always just go go call for a head judge if you think they're wrong um or if you think um like if you think the penalty is just a kind of unjustified for the situation because that might be what it normally is but if you feel like the the situation can be resolved or reversed in a way that would be adequate and you shouldn't receive a penalty you can you know state your case and you'll see what the see what the head judge gives you if you do really want a second opinion on the uh on the situation so always remember that so one thing also to mention here is that judges will always try to salvage the game state, right? Even if yep. it's not a perfect fix, as long as it is like very close to where things were, they will try to make it happen. So I have a good story of something that happened to me at a tournament that actually is around this. And this was in 2018, so I'd imagine some rules have maybe slightly changed since that time frame. But I was playing in day two um, against Peter Kika, who's a very good and successful player. He got second place at a regionals this year i believe it's a caucus regionals um yep. and he was playing a night march lucario deck lucario gx very you know peter's very known for playing night march and he just decided to cram lucario in there that <laughs> weekend and i was playing pikachu zekrom which is probably the reason that he chose to cram lucario gx in his his night march deck but um, I played a Zerkatry GX in my deck, which was very good against the heavily specially special energy reliant Night March deck. Um, pretty much my win condition in the matchup was to attack with Zerkatry, try to knock out Riolus before they could become Lucario's, and hope that he maybe prized some of his, you know, basic fighting energies and stuff like that. It was kind of a bad matchup for me. But uh, Zerkatry is not usually something you're attacking with in that deck. So I had not used it very much up to this point in the tournament. Its attack does 100 damage. Do you know what its attack does, Azul, off the top of your head? Yeah, 100 damage, and then discard the top card of your opponent's deck. So are you seeing where the issue maybe yeah. has arisen here? <laughs> uh, Peter and I both forgot about the discard the top card of your opponent's deck effect. And it was one of the situations where um, we did it, and then he started playing his turn. And then partway through his turn, I leaned over and looked at my Zerkatry, and I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to have discarded a card. And he was like, oh, yeah, you were supposed to have discarded a card. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, well, what do we want to do? And so we called over a judge and they Peter had like already played his supporter like it was pretty backwards. And so what judges try to do in these spots is they rewind it as much as they can to try to get the game state as close to what it should be. So basically they were able to identify he played research for turn. These cards should be in his hand. These are the cards he drew off of research. Let's put them back into the deck. Boom, boom, boom. Rewind it as much as possible. Shuffle his deck. He is at the start of his turn. And now the deck is shuffled. We'll discard a random card off the top. And now Peter draws a card and starts his turn. So that's what ended up happening. Um, I do think we actually just got a warning for that. Um, so that is what makes me think this occurred before this most recent update. Because I think by you know, standards here. One or both of us should have received a double prize penalty. Probably me because it is my card, I guess. Um, but we just got a warning and that could have been a situation of the judge reading the room as well of being like, it was a mistake and it was able to be fixed. I think pretty much all the way. Um, it's obviously not perfect because theoretically the card that got shuffled uh, is different than the card that would have been discarded right off the top of his yeah. deck. Oh, yeah, because it wasn't perfect as well because they had to rewind it to before his research and they had to shuffle his hand and put a card on top of his deck because it was like we don't know what the card was he top decked. Um, so it like was not a it was far from a perfect fix. But um, yeah. But yeah, that's like a good example of how these things can from a minor issue escalate to a situation where the game state is not really the same as it would be, but they try to get it as close, right. As it was before. Yeah, I think what, 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 
Yeah, but it would like almost end up in like a double game loss. They're just like, all right, well, if we can just get it close, then you guys just still play one game, yes. right? Or like double prize penalty, just get it as close as possible. Which, yeah, it's cool to see more of that. Like the po- the not only do the players want to be playing Pokemon, the judges also want you to be playing as much Pokemon as possible. So they don't just want to like have to go to like, you know, round one of the tournament starts and then they give double game loss to half the players in the room or something, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> like, whenever, whenever things cannot be rewound to a certain point, that is when severe gameplay errors come into play, which is the last final step here. Severe gameplay errors result in an irretrievably broken game state, such that a judge cannot reasonably be expected to restore it to a point where it can continue without compromising the integrity of that game to an unacceptable extent. So basically, once things are just past the point of no return. Some examples may include shuffling the hand, prize cards, or discard pile into the deck into the deck without the use of a card effect. Um... I've seen this happen before where players are searching their discard pile uh, during a search and then they think they're done with their search and they pick up their discard pile and shuffle it into their deck. Like I've seen that happen before. (laughs) Uh, Just kind of like a brain fart moment, right? So, and that would be a situation of I've put my whole discard pile into the deck. We At that point, it is unretrievable because you cannot, maybe if it's early enough, you could remember exactly what cards were discarded if both players agreed, but um another example is retrieving or putting away cards from a game in progress before the match slip is signed to show that both players agree on the outcome and then the final one is failing to set up prize cards at the beginning of the game resulting in potential access to six additional cards for three or more deck searches so not realizing that you've forgotten to set your prizes uh once you've searched the deck so that that's kind of an interesting one that they list in both sections right in the major gameplay error it's if you've searched the deck one or two times but if you searched it three or more times that becomes a severe gameplay error interesting yeah i actually do the 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 one where they without even knowing that like that was a penalty like i actually don't pick up my side of the field until this the match is signed i didn't even like i didn't even know that was like in there for the severe <laughs> but i don't actually pick up my cards until the match is signed like if my opponent says all right i'll concede uh if we're in game three and they're all right i concede um i won't pick up my cards until the match is signed but i never even thought like i didn't even like think that was a penalty i didn't even know yeah i've heard stories <laughs> before uh, in the instance why this may be in here I've, I've heard stories before of um players you know picking up like the game finishes they pick up their games and then they go to sign the match slip and then a player is like oh what are you talking about i won both of those games and then someone's like no we tied i won one you won one and the guy's like no i won both of them and so at that point, it becomes a question of, you know, he said, he said, she said, they said, whatever. And um, I don't even know what a judge does in that situation, <laughs> to be honest, because it's like there's. The, and so that's why I think this is in here probably as a severe gameplay error. They probably would just both get a game loss at that point if the players can't agree on who won the match, which is kind of silly to say. Um, so that's yeah. a good thing to remember to do. Sign the match slip before. You, you put your, your cards, cards away. And then also check yeah. the on the match slip for anyone who's not played in a Pokemon tournament before. There is a box next to each game on both players' sides. So the way a match slip is laid out, you've got a player's name, player A's name, player B's name, and then game one, game two, game three in the middle of the, the, the slip. And then next to game one, there's a box on either side of game one next to a player. So if you win game one, check that little box with a pen or pencil, whatever you've got there, so that it is, you know, written down, set in stone. I did indeed win this game. Um, yeah, that's like not something I, that's not something I do. I should probably do that one as well. <laughs> I don't remember to do that one at all. I will also say um, it is helpful to me as a caster when I'm walking around looking at tables and I'm trying to see what game people are in or what the stakes are at the game they're in. Like if they need to win this one, if they're, you know, maybe in a situation where they can play to the tie, whatever it might be, if like time is like almost up, uh, depending on how many who who's won the game right game one or what game they're in so uh um, yeah but it's definitely just good practice to be in so that none of these situations can occur because i've heard stories of them happening as i'm sure as has has as well yeah i definitely heard it before um where, sometimes the players were getting sometimes yeah you never know what um what players could be doing trying to do to get an advantage so you know protect yourself in in those regards for sure um <clears throat> the last thing i want to talk about and we actually have like a so we talked about a couple cheating thing not cheating things uh mistakes happening on stream last week from baltimore regional another one has come to light uh in since last week 
Um, and I don't want to talk about it in terms of did they cheat, did they not cheat. Um, uh, the thing I mainly wanted to kind of talk about was um, the idea of when you know you do see someone make a gameplay error. Um, and the bigger ones, of course, always come up when it's on stream, right? Um, so like this one was specifically, I don't remember which round this was. Um, it was like maybe round 13, 14? Uh, round um, 14. Round 14. It was Jeremy versus uh, Tanner. And uh, Jeremy definitely insufficient, insufficiently shuffled their deck after a Rotom Phone use. And I actually, I don't think Jeremy cheated. I think it was an honest mistake um, for the situation. Um, the, the thing I want to kind of talk about is how it feels like the community has become a little bit toxic towards the, you know, when stuff like this happens on stream, it feels like a lot of people jump to um, using the word cheating or calling them a cheater, right? Which I think it should be, and I think in on the flip side of that, I think too many people get, uh, so it's a, it becomes a little hostile on both sides where people use those words uh, and make those assumptions. Uh, and then on the other side, people immediately are kind of a little bit hostile and towards of defending the player um, that they just made a mistake, you're wrong, whatever. When I think it should, we should definitely be able to have a discussion about what happened, right? Like what actually happened in those matches or those scenarios that happened, specifically on stream, they're going to come up way more often than not, right? Um, that's where we'll be able to, everyone will be able to see it and be able to talk about it. So I think it should be able to be discussed. And this one specifically uh, was brought to light, I guess, on Twitter by Michael Cato. I think uh, Katron's post on Twitter was actually pretty good, right? To just kind of didn't call Jeremy a cheater, uh, just literally said what happened. Wrote him phone uh, at 3:23 on the match timer. Jeremy uh, keeps a boss on top of his deck while shuffling versus Tanner Hurley. Confirmed by Avery. Played at 31:51 to draw a tablet, which he took off the phone and boss, which he kept on top of his deck, right? And if you Katron watch the video, saying, I've got it up here for the people who are watching on YouTube. Um, if you watch the video at the point I'm at now, you can see. He's put the boss on top of the deck and now is shuffling and the top card never changes. It's a pretty poor shuffle, which in yep. the rule book is known as insufficient randomization. Yeah. And then after that puts the tablet that they got from Rotophone on top, uses Avery draws into the tablet and the, the boss plus another card. I don't know what the other card is. The other card's not relevant. Um, uses the tablet, gets the KO, and then uses boss next turn to win or something. Right. Or they potentially need a boss to win the game next turn. So, um, it looks bad. I think it's an honest mistake from Jeremy. They definitely insufficiently shoveled, so they should have been penalized for that potentially. Um, uh, and I think Katron's post about the situation specifically was also just fine. They literally just said what happened, and I think we should be able to make those kind of posts, um, and those should be able to come up, uh, you know, on Twitter or Facebook groups or whatever in the Pokemon community to be like, "Yo, this happened. It's definitely a gameplay error. Um, do we think it was?" worse more than that or less than that i don't think we should need to jump to calling people cheaters or jump to calling you know calling the people out who brought it to light or there doesn't need to be an argument there just it's there should just be a discussion right we should be able to discuss the the clip um come to terms if we think it was maybe malicious or not you don't even have to bring up the the words like cheater or malicious you can keep that to yourself or take it to someone else of like higher authorities, you know, like whatever, but like we should be able to have the discussion in not such a hostile way. Cause I feel like every time there is a discussion around a clip like this, it's always super hostile. We should be able to post the clips, have a discussion about it, but not have it be hostile is what I definitely, what I wanted to, to say. Cause like we want to catch cheaters when we think people are cheating. Right. So sometimes you need more than just your own opinion, looking at a clip and you want to bring it to light within the community. Cause if the person is cheating, we all want them to be caught. Right. But it doesn't need to be a hostile discussion, which I think is what most of these uh, situations turn into. Right. Someone posts a clip of an error being made on stream and then it's in the comment section. It's just really hostile back and forth. Right. Yeah. And Jeremy did release a response, responded to this. Someone brought it up in one of the big Facebook groups, Verbank City. And Jeremy did respond and say, um, uh, about shuffling, I did to the best of my ability. I had an eight-ish card deck and shuffled the best I could and even offered a cut. I had my entire turn to find the boss. I had no reason to stack it. He also consistently cut my deck throughout our entire match. I would have had no way of knowing he wouldn't cut. And then the person who asked him the question said, okay, thanks. And then Jeremy responded again and said, no problem. It was an honest coincidence, and I'll be at many events to prove that. I played many great players in that event, and I'm sure all of them will say there wasn't a hint of suspicion. 
And I will yeah. just mention what the tournament rules handbook does say about insufficient shuffling or randomization because there is a whole section to it, section 5.7.2, insufficient randomization – insufficiently randomizing the deck is a rules violation that may carry a penalty. It is therefore in the interest of each player to become comfortable with a shuffling technique that is both quick and thorough. There is no mention of it under any of the gameplay error sections. The only mention further in the rules handbook is under the cheating section, which is uh, there is no penalty for cheating. Cheating results in disqualification from the event and the section here says there is simply no place in play pokemon for those who choose to cheat to gain an advantage over their opponent as such all instances of cheating are regarded as severe and merit disqualification examples may include intentionally drawing extra cards or taking cards from the discard pile and adding them to the deck or hand aka palming arbitrarily adjusting the special conditions or damage counters on Pokemon in play. So maybe trying to reduce the damage on a Pokemon when your opponent's not looking. Stacking or deliberately randomizing the deck insufficiently to engineer greater access to a card or cards. And then for VGC, using a game console with custom firmware. That is also listed in here because it does cover all Pokemon games. Can you cheat in Pokemon Go? Or is that not even possible? <laughs> I, do, I don't know that people have figured out a way to do it yet, but I'm sure it'll come. Yeah, so I, I do know if you ran, if you get a warning for random or insufficient shuffling, your next warning would be a prize penalty. So if that would have been Jeremy's first warn, first time getting a warning, it would have just been a warning, and then warnings after that lead to prize penalty. Because uh, I've had it myself. <laughs> I've, got, I've gotten that one, unfortunately. Um, uh, oh no, mine was for slow play actually. Mine was for playing for too too slow. Never mind. Mine was not intuition shuffling. Yeah, in the finals of LAIC, right? So I, think right? Thing with, uh, I think it's the same thing. Oh, maybe I'm incorrect on that then. That's yeah, yeah. That's pace of play. I thought pace of play. I thought that one was insufficient shuffling. But they both might be warning. I know. I think and, they both are warning into penalty. Well, the issue here um, is like it's all about intent, right? So if a judge thinks, yeah, yeah, if if it's thought that you're doing it intentionally, um, then it would just be. Re re uh, referred to as cheating, which results in disqualification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if if yeah. you're like playing fast at the end of your round and you just do a quick little one two shuffle, present to cut, that's not enough shuffling, right? Even if you're trying yeah, to play yeah. so quick. That's what I'm saying. So if it's yeah. not intentional, you will still be penalized for it, as you yeah. should, right? You can't even if you don't do it on purpose. If you take too long, like I did, <laughs> and you take too long again, you get you know warnings into penalties. Same thing for uh, insufficient shuffling, warning into penalties on that one as well. So make sure you're insufficient. Make sure you're playing at a proper pace and make sure you're sufficiently shuffling. But like I said. Yeah, I don't think uh, Jeremy uh, did anything malicious here. I think it's just bad, bad shuffling. And then, you know, I think he'll definitely learn from this. And then most likely they'll, you know, do better in the future, hopefully. And then we can all learn from that, right? We should all try and, you know, be sufficient with our, our randomization. Um, but also be, uh, what, did, what did the rule book say? Like, be good, speedy thorough. with it. Don't be thorough, thorough, but efficient, right? Yes. Thorough, but timely or something. Yeah. So that's all I want to say on that. Yeah, I think it's just like... The conversations I feel like I've been getting really toxic recently. Like we should be able to have those discussions. It we should bring these these kind of clips or whatever to light because I've seen that before as well. It's like why are people always trying to start witch hunts? Um, when definitely a lot of the times when people bring up the clips, they're not trying to they're they're not specifically calling anyone cheaters or saying they're doing anything malicious. They're like, okay, this happened, and then it's the comment section under the clip that gets really you know nasty. And and I think it's definitely we should we need to come to an understanding on both sides where it's like we should be able to bring these clips up. Um, and we just shouldn't be so toxic about it and um, in the in the comments, you know, just like talk about it, discuss it. But, you know, no need to start calling people cheaters immediately and stuff like that. Well, we do need to move on because we have spent quite a bit of time in this section. So let's move it along to the update around the Latin America International Championship, which will be the first I see of the new season of the 2023 season. And for anyone who doesn't know exactly how these events work, they are internationals, but still the largest group of players will be the ones from that region. So in Latin America, it'll be Latin America players, Oceania, Oceania, Europe, Europeans, and then North America, North Americans, as makes sense. But they're internationals, so they want players from other regions to come and compete at these tournaments and the way that that is made possible for many players is through travel awards and stipends so if you in a specific time frame finish as one of the top four players of your region 
you earn a travel award to the internationals for that specific time frame which and the time frame between all these internationals is from the end of one ic to the next so it would be like this latin american international championships once it ends right at that point the championship meter will start ticking for the next ic which will be oceania and people you know taking the points from latin america correct yeah the points from latin america go towards oceania isn't that right and... Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like as the end of NA, uh, end of NAIC, that was the cutoff point for travel awards and stipends for LAIC. And now between NAIC and LAIC, that will be the travel awards yeah. and stipends yeah, yeah. for uh, we, it's OCIC, OCIC yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We know that for sure. Yeah. So yeah, um, but the problem is uh, we don't have the confirmed travel award and stipends for players for. Uh, LAIC, which is coming up. We finally got the date too late, and we talked about that. But the one thing they didn't give us information on was the the stipends and travel awards, right? Which for some regions, like Australia, is a little bit easier to figure out. <laughs> but uh, I have a friend who who top aided NAIC, and they're not sure which like a top eight of an NA, uh, of an IC is usually enough to get the stipend or close. But they actually don't know for sure if they have the stipend for LAIC or not, which if they're in top 16, they get $1,000. If yeah. they're not, they don't. And that, that's the, the difference between them going or not. So they don't know if they should book their ticket for LAIC yet or not. And Pokemon hasn't released the information. And you could figure it out, right? The players could go, um, maybe someone has. They said they haven't been able to find anyone who has. I haven't done it. Um, but – uh, we shouldn't have to. The players, like some of the players, shouldn't have to get all the results from all the tournaments, combine them, and figure out the championship points for each player. We should. They have the data. Pokemon has the results of all the tournaments that count towards LAIC stipends and travel awards. They should just release the list for all the regions, so everyone knows who does and who doesn't have those, so people can, you know, book their travel accordingly. So even though this is affecting less people in terms of you know, deciding when to go or not based on just the dates, it's still affecting some people on whether or not they're going to be able to go. Or now if it gets too late and if flights get too expensive, $1,000 might not be enough to be the difference between going or not, right? Right. And on the leaderboards on the Pokemon website, in the past, like this past season and the season before, there's a section on the leaderboard for each international championship. So you can see where you stand as far as getting a potential stipend. So for example... They even the... had it for... NAC. Yeah, for the North American International Championship, there was a leaderboard that kept track from uh, players' finishes from the start of the new season, you know, when we started things back up in March of this year, up until EUIC ended. And pl so players were able to know, like, number one up here, who got second place at EUIC, Frank Persick, 400 championship points. That was enough to secure him first place, moving into NAIC, which meant he got a... Uh, travel award and the top four players ended up getting travel award top 16 of course getting a stipend um and you're able to track it in the past just here on the leaderboards page but if we look at the leaderboard all we see is 2022 world championships and we are still getting travel awards this year there is a whole section about it on the international championship page but for some reason just this season they've not implemented the leaderboard <laughs> on the website yet i don't know why I mean, get that they just it's one of those things again where they're really coming up short on the information um like they came up short on the information of just when is laic now they're coming up with short on the information of who has the stipend to travel or LAIC. and if someone out there is hearing this and has done the math uh definitely let us know tweet at us put it in the comment section whatever we'll look for it and then uh, i can at least if my friend hasn't figured it out <laughs> i can at least let them know where they stand so yeah if someone has done the done the numbers some people go out of the way to do that but that's another thing like play like you shouldn't have to go out of your way to do the numbers. It should just be in the leaderboard or they should have like released something with the, the, the numbers. I haven't seen anything yet. And I know um, they haven't seen anything as far as uh, up until as far as Baltimore goes. So I know they don't know uh, at least in that time frame. I haven't talked to them since Baltimore. So they maybe know now, but maybe they don't, but it should have been released, you know, before, before that. So kind of yeah. sucks. And you should have one as well, obviously, since you won in AIC. Yeah. So um and if you haven't received an email yet, I would imagine no one has received an email, right? Yeah. Yeah, they do eventually send out emails, but, like, that might be too late for some people, right? So you definitely want to try and 
book your flights probably ahead of when they like I, i've already booked my flight for laic i haven't got my email yet i assume i'll be getting one eventually but you would want to you know book it when the flight is cheapest <laughs> ideally still right and yeah so that's something we hope that they make an update to very soon but we can move on from all of this and start looking at the results from some events this past weekend or i guess two weekends ago now at this point there were two tournaments which took place with the brilliant sorry wow brilliant stars no <laughs> the uh origin. lost origin format so sword and shield through lost origin with also a couple other cards that were legal that we don't have access to yet but nothing too too major uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit and let's start off by talking about the singapore regional league which took place we've got the results to look at here and it was won by the lost zone box which i think undoubtedly has been the most popular new deck from this yep. lost origin set yeah definitely i think it might be the uh best deck overall it's just so powerful uh such a powerful deck maybe it's still pocket intellion but yeah lost one box has been ridiculous yeah not surprised to like see it take it take it down uh for sure definitely the best lost one deck for sure i mean i think some giratina players may you know want to have a word with you about <laughs> it but uh, and giratina speaking of which did still do pretty well it got a top four placement as a lost zone box version of the deck with the comfy engine but there was also two players who finished in the top eight that were playing arceus giratina which this was a pretty popular way i think in japan for people to play giratina for a little while whenever it first came out people were playing it like this um, because you don't have to accelerate to it with Mirage Gate. It's just kind of the combo that's meant to work together. You don't have to do it like that, though. You can just do it the good old-fashioned way with Trinity Nova. And there's actually some cool things you can do with Arceus as well, because with Giratina's attack, it just says discard two energy, or lost zone two energy. It doesn't say energy cards. So you can lost zone a double turbo uh, yeah. for for the um, Giratina's attack, which is actually pretty good and uh, pretty pretty reasonable. Yeah, so that's like a really cool like interaction. I haven't tested that build of the deck at all, um, so I kind of have like no opinion on that one. But that is like it definitely seems strong. Being able to one hit KO pretty much anything relevant in the format with the Giratina is uh, pretty good. And the Arceus, of course, can't. I mean, Arceus is just good as well, right? So just two really good Pokemon together. It's kind of like just taking cut the cut up cut the Pikachu for now and put in the Giratina instead. See how that goes. The next best way to play Arceus not Inteleon deck. Um, uh, a little bit of a surprise to me though was that there was three Mews in top eight. Um, so I, I mean I don't think Mew was dead or anything, but that was definitely a lot of Mew. Um, so that was a little bit unexpected. And there was no Palkia and Teleon in top eight at all as well, which is another interesting point. But yeah, Mew still alive and well I think for sure in the uh, in the new format. And the the second place list was the 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 quad DTE build. Yeah, and this is kind of now I would say become the more popular way to play Mew. Though I would say going into a field that may or may not include Drapion, maybe the Fusion Strike build is a little bit better uh, just because you have that one prizer that you can work in that can do so much damage. Though I think this version is overall just like in a vacuum, probably a little bit more powerful just because it's more consistent and more straightforward, more streamlined, right? The uh, Fusion Strike Energy one, you know, I mean, Mew was pretty good for a long time before this quad DTE build came out, right? Um, so I don't think that that it necessarily is any worse. This version just seems to be pretty solid. And they did pack the one copy of Lost City in here as well, which seems to be kind of the staple now at this point. Yeah, Lost City is super good in Mew. And yeah, we don't actually even know what the other builds of Mew were. Um, yeah. But it looks like there was definitely probably um, not too much... Drapion. I mean, there was a Drapion in the winning list in the... Uh, yeah. uh, I guess one thing to mention about it as well, it was Lost Box, but it was a Mirage Gate build. There definitely is two distinct different builds of Lost Box, right? Mirage Gate versus no Mirage Gate. Um, and that they, they did pack a Drapion, but I would assume not many other decks did if uh, if the Muse did this well. Three of them in top eights. Pretty big deal for sure. And no Palkia Intellion in top eight, but there was a Palkia Curum, the new big bed, V Max. And I think this is a card, we talked about this last week or a couple weeks ago maybe, whenever the set first came out. This is a card that I think was like pretty heavily overlooked, but then now has become a pretty solid contender in the meta, without a doubt. Yeah, it seems like it for sure. Yeah, I definitely don't think a card I overlooked. I still don't think it's, from what I've played with it, it doesn't seem that strong overall. 
I mean, obviously the Kyrim is very powerful when it sets up, but setting it up and then like continue, consistently getting enough energy on it just doesn't seem to be, uh, I mean, it just doesn't seem that powerful overall. So I think it'll probably, and, and it doesn't seem like there's that much you can do with the deck either for like major improvements that could come along. So I think it will kind of be a tier two, tier three deck throughout its its lifespan unless uh, someone comes up with a really, really cool way to to play the deck. But yeah, definitely better than I thought it was uh, was going to be overall. And that is getting those placements in in uh, in tournaments and online tournaments and stuff. So congratulations to all the top eight finishers here in Singapore. We've, of course, also got the Champions League tournament to talk about. And this Champions League is maybe the largest player base size Pokemon tournament ever. Maybe someone out there knows for sure yeah. if it was or not, but it has to be close. <laughs> 3,166 players. Absolutely insane. You can tell that yeah, the like people of Japan are very excited <laughs> that Worlds is going to be in their home country this year. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, it's like even more crazy when you think about it because their their tournaments are, you can only get into their tournaments through a lottery system. So 3,166 players showed up, but I'm not sure out of how many tried to get into the tournament, right? Like if this tournament had as many people as it could, you know, it could have been like 10,000. I don't even know. Like how many people are trying to get into these tournaments, right? Like we think our tournaments here in America are huge, uh, of course, but um, yeah, we don't have a lottery system for our <laughs> for our regionals, right? And it seems like we don't need one either. Like our we, like our registrations are open for a decent amount now, you know, 24 hours or whatever. So um, we know that they're uh, we're getting we get pretty close to as many players who would want to show up to our regionals, right? But uh, these tournaments in Japan, there's 3,000 people, but they have to go through a lottery lottery system first. It would be crazy to see how many people would actually show up if they could have and as many people as would show up, right? Right. And their tournament structure is definitely different than ours. I'm actually not sure what the tournament yeah. structure was for the Singapore event, but down here at the bottom of Limitless, it does say that the tournament structure was nine rounds of Swiss Day 1 into five rounds of Swiss Day 2. So I guess that's actually similar to ours. And then top 16 single elim. So I guess it is I think the same. Best of one, though. What's that? I think they maybe I think they maybe did best of one. I don't know if I heard that right or not. Oh, or the... that, they do normally do best of one, I'm pretty sure. So, uh, But maybe best of three for don't top quote me, don't quote I don't me, know. Uh, but top 16 single elim, which I think, you know, for a tournament that size, I'm definitely a fan of. Uh, and I wouldn't be opposed to doing top 16 single elim for um, yeah. the regionals of ours that get to that over 800 player mark, right? Yeah, I I think we need something a little bit more. Either another round, like we're up to six rounds, but I think it really should be a top 16 or asymmetrical. One of the two would be fine. I think we just need something. Sure. Um it definitely feels a little off. But it's pretty apparent when you look at this Limitless page that Lost Origin had a pretty big impact <laughs> on the event. The first and second place deck, of course, being one being Giratina, the other being the Lost Box deck. And this second place Lost Box deck is the one that players kind of copy-pasted and started doing really well with uh, in online events. I think Cal Connor won a late night with this same 60, just uh, the only difference being... In Japan, they have the Serena card, and we don't have that card, so Cal swapped it for a boss. <laughs> and uh, I think, I'm pretty sure that it was the same list outside of that. The triple echoing horn, the four escape ropes, um, and really relying, the main attacker being Sableye with the lost mine attack, which you can only use if you have 10 or more cards in the lost zone, and you place 12 damage counters on your opponent's Pokemon and play in any way that you like. Yeah, I, one thing I want to mention, which I'm just going to confirm this is actually... Uh, maybe I'm wrong on this. This was... Um, oh, Mr. Information on the Uncommon Energy podcast as well. Yeah, so for <laughs> Singapore Regionals, uh, Pokestats tweeted out uh, on the top eight of the Singapore Regionals. Also, a special note, players from all divisions played each other, which means top eight cut is shared and does feature one junior player and one senior player, along with six Masters players. So their Regionals was... Uh, there was no divisions for their regionals, it sounds like then. So a junior and a senior competing with the Masters players, which is definitely interesting. Or was um, there divisions and note. they just added the first and second junior and senior? Is that what that means? I don't think so, because it says players from all divisions played each other, which oh, means top okay. eight cut is shared. Yeah, so I think it was just like one pool of players, okay. um, which is interesting, which is what they do in like, you know, like Magic and stuff. It is just one pool of players, so... Um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to be their whole system over there. If that was this one regional, or if that's how all their events are going to be ran. But I just thought that was interesting. And seeing that the senior, a senior and a junior main top eight is also pretty cool. 
Um, but outside of the Lost Box deck doing really well in the Champions League, I mean, there was a ton of them in top 16, some Giratina yep. as well. There was still a ton of Palkia and Tellian actually taking, what, one, two, three, four, five, six of the top 16 spot, which is a pretty huge share. Yeah, five of them were Lost Box, six of them Palkia. So Palkia, no Palkia in Singapore, uh, three in the top eight here. So Palkia, the most dominant deck in the top eight, none in the none in the top two. Um, but yeah, Palkia still showing. Pretty much can compete, right? It seems like it can compete with uh, the Lost Box deck for sure. Um, the most interesting deck, of course, I think out of both of the top eights was Rotom. There was a Rotom deck, Rotom V. Was there V Max? We don't know because there's no deck list for the deck. Um, I haven't seen anything about it on Twitter, <laughs> but there was a Rotom deck in top eight of the 3,000 person uh, tournament in Japan, which is I, it's the first result, only result I've seen for Rotom yet. Is it a thing? Will we know? Do they have the broken list and they're not going to share it? Who knows? <laughs> I have not gotten to go back and watch these streams yet. I was going to watch some of them this week, though. Um, so I'm not sure if the Rotom player got on stream, but I'm going to say if they didn't make it on stream, that's just an absolute crime for sure. Yeah, you got to. You had to have put them on at some point, right? Like, that's just... I mean, to me, that's ridiculous. Um, but I also want to know what the list is so I can play it as well, so... <laughs> So that is definitely a cool one. And then there was still uh, one Mew and one Reggie Gigas to round out the top 16 here. Both, I think, decks yeah. that people still think are pretty decent. Reggie Gigas may be in a little bit more questionable of a spot. Um, but we'll talk about kind of... Polyons. Yeah, we'll talk about a little bit more of the meta and kind of how quickly the meta has been evolving this past week because it's really kind of crazy how quick things have been moving just in the span of a few days. We'll talk about that, though, as we get into more of the Peoria meta forecast. But for now, we'll take a quick little break from all that talk and get into everyone's favorite segment, which is of course, guess that flavor text where each week Azul or I picks a card and reads the flavor text to the co-host and has them try to guess what Pokemon we are talking about, what Pokemon card that flavor text comes from. There are three lifelines. If you don't use any lifelines, you get four points. You lose a point for each lifeline used. And the three lifelines are what set the card is from, what stage the card is, and read an attack name. I kind of gave Azul one last week that I thought he'd be able to get. Didn't quite close it out, though. Let's see what he's got for me this week, though. I'm ready, Azul, if you got it. I've got it. All right, Chip, here we go. <clears throat> it has a very tenacious nature. Its acute sense of smell lets it chase a chosen prey without ever losing track. Hmm, okay. So I'm definitely thinking of something that's like a predator-type Pokemon, so something um, like a fox, like Thievil or uh, something like that, potentially cute sense of smell though emphasis there so what pokemon's got a big old schnoz i can't really i mean the first one i think of there is probo pass but it's definitely probo pass it and hunting anything i don't think no, um, i don't think uh, i don't think probo pass is uh, a predator no. I'm, I'm gonna need some lifelines here let me let me before i use my lifelines let me have you read the flavor text one more time Okay, here we go. Uh, it has a very tenacious nature. It's a cute sense of smell. Let's it chase a chosen prey without ever losing track. A cute sense of smell. Okay. Let's go with lifeline number one, what stage the card is. It is a basic. Okay, so it is not thievil, Um, which is what my first, first thought was. Tenacious nature as well is something. So... Hmm, okay. Let's have you uh, read an attack name. It's a basic. Bite. Bite? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not super helpful. <laughs> and I guess let's just use them all. I'm going to need some help here. I'm really kind of unsure of where to go with this one. What what set it's is the card from? Vivid Voltage. Okay. Everyone's favorite set. The most competitive Sword and Shield set, without a doubt. <laughs> um all right i did open up a bit of vivid voltage so i think through the common basic pokemon maybe a little bit um a galar pokemon maybe i'm trying to i can't even remember man that car that set is so unmemorable 
It's hard for me to to think through what I'm. This is the first time I think I've really had no true direction with where to guess. Um, I would have hoped Vivid Voltage would have helped me. The only card I can think of from the set right now is like Charizard. It's obviously not that, which is like you know Charmander was what I would guess, but it's not. It's definitely not that. Um, I think there is a man. I really, I really don't know. I gotta guess something. Let's go. Pokemon with a big nose, a cute sense of smell. Sandile. Is that your guess? It's not Sandile, but yeah, I don't even think know if there's one in Vivid Voltage. No, it is not Sandile. That it is. It didn't even sound like a sandile flavor text. I just had to guess something. What what we got? Poochiana. Poochiana. Yeah. It is a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I it thought you would have dog. Like guessing like a, a rock rough or something. But I don't know if there's a rock rough in Vivid Voltage. I would have never <laughs> gotten to Poochiana, I don't think. From Vivid Voltage. But I thought you were maybe gonna get there. I thought you were gonna start listing off dog Pokemon or or like Yeah, uh, I didn't you know, quite have boxes. that thought. That's where I thought you were going to go once you said Thievo. I was like, okay. Uh, but I was in there, I was like, I hope he ends up on Rockruff and not Poochiana. <laughs> I was thinking too much about a fox. I should have thought about dog Pokemon. I That, that was yeah. kind of a – I wasn't anywhere close this week, not going to lie. <laughs> I'm going to blame it on the All lack right. of sleep with having a child, to be honest. <laughs> That's definitely fair. That's going to do it for Guess That Flavor Text. Let us know in the comment section on the YouTube channel how you guys did. What are your points at currently? How many lifelines did it take you to get to Poochiana? Or did you miss this week like Chip uh, as well? Peoria Regionals this weekend. I'm preparing for it. And uh, it's looking to be potentially the biggest regional ever. After we just had the biggest regional ever um, in Baltimore. Looks like we might go back to back, which we've done before in seasons where it's just like the next regional kind of trumps the next one. I don't think Salt Lake will trump Peoria, but something like Dallas could definitely become the biggest later in the year. Uh, but that's what we're looking at right now. And Arlington. Uh, we've had Arlington. What'd I say? Dallas? Dallas, yeah. I mean it's no one call it's it is basically Dallas, isn't it? Right there. <laughs> is it's it? not far from DFW, I know that. Oh, it's not okay. far from DFW. I like, don't know what the airport is to go to. For yeah, time. DFW. Okay. okay. <laughs> DFW. Oh, yeah, it is like right there. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> so, uh, like you mentioned, limitless online results or, or online results in general seem to be having a big impact on the meta. We just we had two regional or two major tournaments in the format, but it definitely feels like stuff has evolved quite a bit since then. Yeah, absolutely. So there's limitless tournaments happening every single night of the week P people are always adjusting and changing their lists um and then this past weekend there was the limitless um i want to call it the right thing the limitless online tournament series event right uh yeah what is, limit, the limitless event? showdown that's right yeah so they do it every month i think yes and these month. tournaments are always massive uh, this one had over 600 players in it, and tons of the best players also compete in these events. I know Stefan was tweeting mm -hmm. playing in this one. Tord participated. Um, Alex Shemansky, Grant. Uh, Grant played. Tons of great players from all across the con uh, the world. We probably don't get that many Australians and also not that many West Coasters just because of the time zone issues, which I think no matter what time you start it, you're going to run into that yeah. pretty much where someone gets a little left out. I think it starts very late for Australia and very early for West Coast, so we don't really see as many players from those time zones competing. But Europe and the East Coast and uh, Latin America, we get a pretty good amount. So... I'll just pull up the results from the event here. It was won by Mew VMAX, and it was the straightforward four double turbo energy build with really nothing new in the list except for the inclusion of Lost City. Yeah, so Mew took it all down. Just Lost City, which is what we saw from the other tournaments, I believe, as well, right? Like the that's kind of what has become very normal uh, for the Mew lists. Yeah. Like the Mew lists that are doing well currently are the No Fusion Strike Energy builds, and they are all playing one Lost City. It seems. Yeah, I seen a couple of two Lost City. Um, I guess yeah. one thing unique about this one is they did have the Path uh, Roxanne combo mm -hmm. uh, in there as well, which you could use to shut down the 
Uh, really the Charizard in the late game against the Lost Zone deck, you know, or if you're in like a mirror match or something, you can do some cheesy stuff with it for sure, right? Um, especially if you could just bump it on your next turn with one of your other stadiums and then get back access to your ability. So uh, got the path Roxanne combo in there. Of course, the Lost City for stuff like, uh, I mean, Lost City is just good against a lot of things, to be honest. Um, but yeah, you on top. And also the Kiram deck, another big placement, right? Coming in second place. Um, and this is the list, actually, I've personally been playing a lot around. It's kind of the list that I'm like, like, all right, I haven't worked too much on Kira. I'm just going to take this list, the list I've been playing a lot. And it did have the double uh, Empoleon in there, which is kind of one of the evolutions of the meta we've been talking about. People started with one Empoleon, and it's like, all right, four escape rope in my Lost Zone deck, or my Lost Box deck. And they were like, all right, what about two Empoleon? And then the Lost Box deck were like, all right, what about canceling Cologne and Path to the Peak? <laughs> and that's, like, all happened in the last, like, four days, five it's days. It's crazy. It's crazy. Like, uh, it, I think this set, for the first time, we're really going to see the impact of how quickly online events are going to move the meta compared to uh, if this uh, tournament had occurred or if, if uh, Peoria regionals was coming up in a timeline where there was no online events that ever happened, the play limitless platform never got created. There was no pandemic. Nothing ever got shut down. People are just, you know, playing Pokemon, no online events, whatever. Um, People would be looking at the results from the Champions League in Japan and also the Singapore tournament. They would see, okay, this Lost Box deck looks pretty good. So at Peoria Regionals, people would roll up with good lists of Lost Box and also people would roll up with their Empoleon techs in their water decks, their Palkias, their Curums, whatever it may be. They might play one, they might play two, something like that. So that's probably what we would see the most of. We would maybe see a couple of people try to go that one step further with their Lost Box and have some answers with paths or colognes, but for the most part, we wouldn't see that. And then yeah. in this event, we would probably see Empoleon doing well. We would still see Lost Box doing well. And people would now, moving just a few weeks later to Salt Lake City, start making adjustments based off of that. And then in Salt Lake City, we might see someone pop up and do well with a Lost Box deck that has four Paths to the Peak or four Canceling Cologne, like some crazy answer. But in this timeline that we're living in right now with online events, all of that that would normally have taken a month to occur has happened in three days. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that kind of just leaves a question I think open going into to Peoria now is I think most Lost Box decks will play Cologne or Path to the Peak. Uh, the question is which one is better, right? And then maybe we'll get that answer at Peoria, right? Because like you, you're not going to play both and the 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 bonus of playing path is that uh, you know it's good against Mew, good against Palkia decks. Like starting down Greninja is nice, good against Kiram. Uh, but it's just off your own Charizard. So like in the late game, your opponent could just be like, "All right, you can keep that path in play." And you're like, "Well, I can't find my vacuum, and I lose now because I can't use Charizard." Right? Um, both bonus of playing the so that's a bonus of playing Cologne, right? That is that you don't shut down your own Charizard constantly, right? You're only turning off their active Pokemon's abilities. Um, but you don't get the buff of, you know, you go up against a Mew or a Greninja deck. You don't have path to kind of slow them down a little bit, right? So there's a little trade-off there, back and forth between those two. Uh, and then if you also play the Colognes, you're more likely to play a different stadium in probably Pokestop. And Pokestop can find your canceling Colognes. You have, like, more outs to find your cards that, you know, help you with Empoleon. But... It's also weird. It also gets weird because then you're like playing six cards. Like you're playing three cologne, three stop, whereas the paths, you're just playing three paths. Then you get plus three spots to make whatever. But then you don't have the aggressiveness of Pokestop. So I think the question, one of the questions to also ask of that is just like, does it feel like Pokestop is necessary for the deck to function consistently? Because uh, if it is, then you should probably go the cologne route. But if it's not, then path might be the the winner. And you could even add something like Punkaboo to be honest. That's something I've thought about. You can go like path plus Punkaboo and sever line on vacuum. Punkaboo is probably a little bit more consistent, especially because you can also scoop up net it. But um, that's the big question for for the uh, law zone decks, I think. Now, I don't think we'll get the answer before Peoria, but so that's like the next stage in the evolution of the deck, I think for sure. Yeah, which one is better? What do people go with? I, I mean, in my experience playing with the deck a little bit, it's it. Pokestop is super good <laughs> in the deck. Good, yeah. yeah, I mean, just to one. be able to to get a turn one yeah find your vip passes a little bit more efficiently or just find your nets. switching cards and nets and stuff mm -hmm. to move around into more comfies to just like stop just lets you see so much more of the deck 
um, which is really beneficial in a deck where your supporter card lets you look at five cards as opposed to just discard your hand, draw seven or something like that, right? Or you're not playing something like Crobat V to see more cards. Um, yep. So Pokestop kind of fills that spot as like an auxiliary boost to your consistency and draw power, right? Let you just build up on your hand instead of, you know, moving yeah. your hand along or something like that. So, yeah, definitely. Something I definitely wanted to talk about, though, from this top cut in the Limitless event was that two Gudras were in the top eight. Not the top 16, the top eight. Now, I wouldn't have been surprised to see, like, one sneak in there, but two? Is this a is this a goo movement, Azul? Are we going to see Gudra <laughs> take over in Peoria this weekend? Uh, it's definitely possible because, like, the Lost Box deck will probably be the most popular deck in the tournament, I think, um, between the, the couple of different variants as well. Like, you kind of, like, put them together i guess the mirage gate no mirage gate whatever um and it's got a pretty good matchup like the you don't you don't do that much damage as the lost box deck but you do just enough with a couple of different unique ways to do it eventually building up into the charizard to kind of you know win games right but uh Gujo takes reduced 80 damage so all of your early cram damage not really doing anything and then when you get into your sableye they've got that ability that just fully heals a Gudra, right so uh, pretty efficient attacker into the one prize stuff for sure. So I think it's a where a lot of Gudra strength comes from. Uh, and another cool part about, you know, there being two different Gudra or two Gudra decks in the top eight, they're both different builds as well. One was an Arceus build uh, and the other one was the Lost Zone build. And the Arceus build actually had a lot more healing in it. Crystal Caves, Hyper Potions, stuff like that. Um, whereas the... Um, <clears throat> The, lost the, uh, box. the other build was kind of, mm. the Lost Box was kind of just set up multiple Gudras and start swinging. No extra healing besides its uh, its ability, right? So that's another question to ask. Is which, what is the best way to play Gudra? I have no clue, personally. Um, I was using Fantinas in my first iteration of Gudra, but neither of them even had a single Fantina. Yeah, I think the first time, uh, I mean, there's definitely plenty of ways to try out the Gudra as well with... Um... You know, the Mirage Gates for the Energy Excel versus the Arceus. And I think that's kind of the question of which... I think Energy Excel is necessary. Which one is better? Yeah. They both got top eight, so little up in the air still. One of the things that is cool about the Limitless platform is you can go in and you can look at players' matches and see what they lost to. Um, so this uh, Gudra player lost to the same... The, the Gudra Lost Box player lost to the same person who got second place with Kieran Palkia two times. They lost to them in Swiss Round 11 and in Top 8. It was the same person. And then early in the tournament lost to a Giratina, but they beat two other Giratinas. So all that information is definitely stuff to look at. So Giratina seems like, you know, solid matchup. 50-50 if not better. Obviously losable as all matchups are, right? Uh, but is losing to the same Kieran player twice indicative of the matchup? Is, is Kieran favored probably just against the Gudra? Seems like it for sure. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I look at the other players' uh, matches and they lost twice to the same Mew player. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. maybe the Mew matchup and the the <laughs> Kira matchup aren't great for Gujo, which makes sense because anything that can one-hit KO Gujo seems like you're probably going to have a rough time. Even if they can only do it once, but Kira can do it multiple times, Mew can probably only do it once. But still, even one time when the Mew can kind of pick apart like, your other two prize Vs very aggressively um, early on in the match to eventually get that one-hit KO later, seems pretty good for Mew and Kiram. So it kind of makes sense that uh, they came up a little bit short to both of those players, the first and second place players, you know, so, um, so Guja good against the, uh, anything I can want to KO it kind of struggles against. So that's why I don't think Guja is great, but if there's enough lost box um, and probably Palkia and Teleon as well, if there's enough of those decks, then I think Guja is in a pretty good spot, but it definitely is not as well-rounded of a deck as something like a Mew or a, you know, a Kiram overall, I don't think, or Palkia and Teleon. So there's still a lot of other unique decks here. I mean, we see a Dialga in top four. We've got Arceus and Tellian making a little bit of a resurgence in the top four as well. A Vikavolt deck in top 16. Um, Reggie Gigas still in the top 32. Blissey making a resurgence as well. Uh, but moving away from Play Limitless and just kind of... We'll talk about some of these decks a little bit more, but let's focus more now on the Peoria discussion and what we think the meta is going to look like. And now, based on all these things happening, what people are going to be playing for the event this weekend. So I guess the biggest question uh, to start with, you know, besides looking at the new decks, looking at the old decks, have the big two from the last format, Palkia and Mew, have they survived? Have they made it? Are they still going to be uh, really good in this format? 
Uh, I mean, it definitely seems like it for sure, right? Like we see Mew winning and right. doing very well in all of the big tournaments. Palkia a little bit more up and down, but Palkia is so well rounded. It maybe just needs to know what it needs to beat a little bit better to like tech out appropriately. Um, but Still yeah, I think plenty of them low. in the the what we got two in top eight or two in top nine four in top 16 of the limitless yeah, yeah. online so it still did well yeah. there it's so i mean palkia and Mew are both so powerful I, it's hard to believe uh, palkia will definitely if it doesn't live on to be a tier one deck in palkia and Talion, i'm sure it'll find a different tier one deck for it to be part of it could be kiram or something right so palkia will be tier one i think no matter what probably Mew will as well um but yeah, just, I guess the question is just, is it Palkia and Talion? And so far, it seems like it's fine. Maybe there's a better way to play Palkia, though. I guess to still be undiscovered, that makes kind of Palkia and Talion obsolete, which I could definitely see. But yeah, still still on the top for sure, I think. And then in regards to the new set, Lost Box, the Lost Zone engine has definitely been the most talked about thing. So what is the best way right now, in your opinion, as well, to utilize the Lost engine? Is it alongside Giratina? Is it alongside the Lost Box focused more on the Sableye? Or maybe the Lost Box with the Mirage Gate Greninja plays? Or something like Hisui and Gudra? Um, I think it, the best one is the Sableye build, the heavier Sableye, you know, like six basic energies or whatever. The deck is so good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the Mirage Gate build needs a little bit better of a read on the meta because it is kind of more of a box. It, it's a more of a, it has, it has more bigger options with Mirage Gate, but you don't want to play everything, right? So I think maybe if the meta gets a little bit more defined, that's where that variant will see a little bit better of consistent success. But I think it's probably not worth playing for Peoria. I think Giratina, the argument for I think Giratina is also not as good as the Sableye build, just kind of as raw power goes. But the argument for the Giratina build is it's less predictable and has way more options. So you don't just like fold to, you know, if you go up against like a Stone Journey, you're never beating that as a Sableye build, right? But the Giratina build, um, not only does it have the same tricks as the uh, Sableye build, just kind of less of them, less of each of them and a little bit less consistently, but you also have the power of Giratina to kind of back you up. So you definitely are a more versatile deck, but I think overall, your consistency and power is a little bit less than the, the Sableye build. So I definitely favor the Sableye build overall, but when it's being targeted, the Giratina build, I think, is probably comes out on top, depending on the meta. Yeah, I like the Giratina build a lot, too. Something else, you know, obviously that's great about Limitless is you can see all the players uh, in the tournaments, even the ones who didn't finish in the top 32. So Tord actually played Giratina at the Limitless online event, and he finished uh, 38th, which is still, you know, solid, 8-3, and three. Um, for such a large event, definitely nothing to scoff at there. He did play Giratina, uh, and looking at his match results, he did lose two games to Palkia Kiram. Yeah, so that's a that might be a rough one to make. Yeah, Kiram is just pretty good against anything that also has, or Palkia in general, I guess anything like anything yeah. else that has two prize Pokemon. The and versatility can, of like yeah. the one KOs and like the Greninja plays. And he's definitely got lots of tricks and like techs going on here. Um, you know, is playing the Radiant Greninja with the water energies. And I think that is pretty common. It feels like in the Giratina yeah. box versions of the deck also has the Drapion V in here, which I think Drapion is a card that if you have a 50, 50 or worse to Mew V max with whatever deck you want to play without Drapion, I think Drapion is an easy include in your deck. And honestly, maybe if your matchup is like 55-45, Drapion might still be worth playing because it's really good against Palkia and Telian as well if they put a bunch of Sobbles in play and you're playing Basic Energy and Choice Belt. You can get some cute plays going there. Um, Drapion, we talked about it when it got released. Kind of just a dumb card. <laughs> yeah. It's really strong. Uh, Azul, do you think that it's worth playing for certain decks this weekend. I do. I, uh, but like, you want to be careful though. Cause if it, if it doesn't actually inc make, if it doesn't actually make the matchup winnable. I wouldn't play it. Like the, remember when everyone's putting Maltrace V in all their decks to beat Mew and it did absolutely nothing. Um, this isn't quite the same thing. Cause Drapion is so much easier to fit into your deck. Plop it, it down on the bench. You... Die Mew. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like... I mean, it doesn't actually give you a winning matchup. I still wouldn't play it. But if it turns out, if it turns it from a 50, 50 or from a losing matchup to a winning matchup, then I would definitely play it. Right. So definitely, Got to test with it, make sure it works how you want it to work and does what it's supposed to do. And you're not just being like, oh, this one, it KOs me. And then you do it and then they go Lost City, KO it, and then they just win the price rate anyways, right? So you got to make sure it actually does it. And if you did play two, 
that's probably enough to beat any Mew. So if you really want to go to way to play two cards that are pretty much dead in every other matchup just to beat Mew, <laughs> um, because it'll, you think it'll help your win percentage overall that much, then that's definitely something you could do as well, right? You could go to two Drapion. But yeah, Drapion, yeah. super good this this weekend, I think, overall for most decks. Like, most decks can pretty easily include it. But make sure you're you're not already beating Mew already, or even with it, you won't beat Mew as well. Do the testing, right? Don't just be like, ah, here's a Drapion. Like, everyone was like, oh, I got two Maltrace V in my deck, and Mew was like, I don't care. I still win, right? So don't just, like, waste your win percentage uh, overall. Like, you don't want to hurt your win percentage overall by adding a bad card like that. Sure. Um, and I do think the Drapion's success as well will be dependent on which version of Mew is more popular. I do still think that the straight, you know, four double turbo energy, no fusion strike energy version of Mew will be more popular. I think it will probably do decent enough this weekend, but I wouldn't be surprised to see some people show up with the fusion strike build and do decently there because it is still obviously strong and it does not do as poorly into Drapion like we mentioned earlier because you've got a one prizer that can do solid damage. Yeah, I don't know how much it changes things though to be honest because like if you attack with Malavita early, it's just like an easy knockout for like anything. But yeah, in they your can deck just attack with something that's not Drapion. That is true. Yeah, exactly. So I don't actually know how much that changes your prize trade to be honest because it's just like it just like kind of it might just slow things down for a turn, right? So yeah, I don't know how much uh, how much that would actually help. Um, I definitely think the DTE version is the better version of Mew, so um, it would just kind of come down to if that makes that big of a difference going up against a Drapion is having the the Meloetta around. <clears throat> One card um, I wanted to ask you about while we're talking about Lost Box still a little bit is the new Snorlax. So this is a card oh, that yeah. some people are playing, some people are not. Um, it seems, you know, if you look at it just kind of at first glance, it would seem kind of unassuming, not that great. It's a basic Pokemon, 150 hit points, Thumping Snore for three colorless. It does deal 180 damage, but this Pokemon is now asleep during Pokemon checkup. Flip two coins instead of one. If either of them is tails, this Pokemon is still <laughs> asleep. So I think most of the time people would just look at this and be like, oh yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like a little gimmicky of a card. Um... I guess its ability is also relevant as well. Prevent all effects of attacks from your opponent's Pokemon done to this Pokemon. And placing damage counters with Lost Mine on Sableye, that is in the effect of an attack. So you cannot Sableye yeah. onto a Snorlax, which is very, very relevant. Yeah, I mean, there'll probably be other targets for the Sableye to focus. I actually think the Snorlax true, is true, pretty true. good if you're playing Mirage Gate because it just... The numbers just line up really well to like combo with Cramorant for like a two-way KO. Because like back to back Crams is only two hundred and twenty damage, which just isn't very much. Uh but back to back Snor or Cramorant into Snorlax is two hundred and ninety, right? Um so it's just two-way KOs, any V's in the format, which is nice. You could hit a V and then clean it up with Sableye as well. So I think it just like it looks like a bad card, but it just like just fits that niche situation. Uh, very well for for Mirage Gate decks to combo with Cram or combo with Sableye, whatever. Just like hitting for 180, just guarantees a two hit KO. Where like back to back Crams can't quite do that, so you don't want to commit like a hit with a Cramorant into a hit with Giratina to do 280 on the next turn and be like, well, I kind of just like wasted an attack, right? Or put a two prizer in my active and put a bunch of energy on it just for it to not get a KO, right? So and the the sleep um, clause is not too big of a deal on this card either because these decks play so many switching cards, out. right? Yeah, yeah, or and you're probably too. getting knocked out. Yeah, that, that is true. <laughs> One that of the two. True. Yeah. So yeah, I think Sonic is, is pretty cool actually in the Mirage Gate decks. It just it just fits the role. It just seems weird, but it just it just works. It's one of those things. What about some of the uh, older archetypes? We kind of talked about this a little bit at uh, for Baltimore Regionals as well. Like one of the decks that we both talked about a little bit was like Arc Intel. Um, would it make a comeback at Baltimore? Which, uh, one did get top 16, Adler got top 16 with Arc Inteleon, and we've been seeing it pop up a little bit more recently, especially in this Limitless tournament. Um, I don't know if it's quite good enough to get there. It's really good against the Lost Box deck. Once again, it's kind of a tanky healing deck, which is just kind of good against Lost Box, tanky, healy, good against Lost Box, but it does still feel like it comes up short to some of the, the heavier hitters, the Kiram's, the Mews, uh, etc., yeah, I think that in the end of this last format, Arc Intel ended up not being as good because of how popular Mew VMAX was with the 4DT. Yep. And that, that's a pretty bad matchup, it feels like. Like, you've got your Roxanne Path and Prey strat, um, but if that doesn't pull off, like, it is very easy for that version of Mew VMAX to hit 280 two times and then just find one boss's orders KO, right? Yeah. Um, what the benefit of current Arc Intel is from the new set, uh, the the big card to me that they got from Lost Origin is the Radiant Gardevoir. 
with the mm -hmm. Loving Veil, all of your Pokemon take 20 less damage from attacks from your opponent's Pokemon V, which is super crucial in the Mew matchup because it makes them have one more damage modifier in order to KO you. And if you get a big charm, that's one more damage modifier for them to KO you. Suddenly KOing two Arceus V stars becomes really hard for the Mew V max deck. Yeah. Also Garatina as well hits 280. Yes. No one plays choice belt 280 minus 20, 260. You're not KOing the Arceus. Uh, even if they, even if you play the choice belt, then if they have the big charm, you also need a vacuum. So like, it really makes it hard, and you really don't want to play choice belt and Giratina. It's basically useless in like every single, in most, uh, most all situations, right? So like, you don't really want to play that card. Um, so yeah, the guard war really does keep you out of range in a lot of scenarios against the, the heavy hitters. I just don't know if it's enough. And also, Kiram's another one as well, I guess, right? Where you could force them to have, I did the math right, I guess the choice belt or the guard for plus the choice belt they need one more energy i think 270 yeah. yeah it would keep you out of range of their choice belt i guess if you had a big charm and then that extra energy would keep you out of range with the guard for so and another yeah, card is that, the heavy hitters. Another, another card that this person who got top four played was the lake acuity as well which i think is okay i would probably still lean more towards path one of the awkward things about path of course, is the fact that you shut off your own Radiant Gardevoir. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. that does make things a little interesting about when you want to put it in play. Um, but so having like an off stadium to use is still nice, I feel like. Um, and maybe Lake Acuity is just the best one to slot in right there. Do you have a thoughts there as well? Yeah, Clap Stadium might still be better, but Lake is, Lake is probably fine. There's probably a decent amount of situations. where There's not that many stadiums and too many decks right now, so you could get it to stick in a lot of scenarios, I think, towards the late game, um, getting an, another reduced 20 damage on your on your Arceus. <laughs> and also, I guess, another thing, cool thing to mention, um, and this this Sobble meta has come around before, but the 70 HP Sobbles are coming back, uh, especially in Arc and Talion, it makes a lot of sense. You don't really want to ever attach to... You don't want to even keep calling. You always want to attach your Arceus turn one. Um, and we've seen, I've even seen people talking about doing it with uh, the, what's it called, decks as well, the Arc Intel deck, or the Palkia Intel decks as well. Like, do you go to 70 HP Sobbles? I think a little bit less good in those decks, because Keep Calling is so much better in the Palkia deck. But um, I could see it, I could see it coming around to that. And last time we had this one, Dragapult was a super, Dragapult VMAX was super popular, does five damage counters to a bench Pokemon. With a Goonping, that's six. Uh, pretty easy to pull off turn two, to be honest. So you're KOing Sobbles, and people are going up to set the 70 HP Sobbles to kind of protect from that scenario. So we're seeing the, the Sobble meta uh, kind of creep <laughs> back in here with uh, Sableye's uh, pings in the Lost Box deck, which is kind of funny. Um, all right, so other new decks to talk about, Kiram and Gudra. Which one of the two? Those seem to be kind of the two. I think like everyone recognizes Giratina is pretty good. Everyone recognizes Lost Box is pretty good. So between Kiram and Gudra, which of the two new decks there do you think uh, will finish higher in Peoria this weekend? Online events uh, would probably lean towards the Kiram, but we did yeah. see the two Gudras here. Do you think someone could come up with the spice? I think probably Kiram. I think Gudra could get better when the meta becomes a little bit more stabilized and it figures out which heavy hitting decks does Gudra need to deal with and how can I potentially deal with some of them? Well, probably still taking an auto loss as the other ones, but like got to figure out which ones you need to be able to prepare, be prepared for first. Um, and how can you deal with it? Maybe at least one of them, right? Yeah. Gudra um, will definitely but, benefit from a more centralized meta for sure. Yeah. And, and maybe it just has to, maybe there, there won't be an answer to that. Then maybe it just needs to be a, a meta where heavy hitting decks just don't really exist. I could see that happening as well, where it's like, right. Gudra is not good until the meta comes around for it. Um, so that could happen as well. But I think, yeah, once we see, it needs a little bit more of a stable matter. Whereas Kiram is a lot more versatile in its like, in what it can deal with and what needs to deal with it. So I think Kiram will definitely see, most likely will be the the higher placing of the, the two decks for sure. And then one um, other new deck to mention is definitely the Hisuian Zoark V-Star. One of them did finish in the uh, top 32 of the Limitless event, which was the top cut. Mm -hmm. It was like an asymmetrical top 16 cut. Um, and that was kind of the way that you've seen it, you know, be played most of the time with the Bibro, the Gengar, uh, seems like it's the kind of way to go. This player did include two copies of Empoleon V and basic water energies, which is kind of wild. <laughs> um, but where, yeah, where do you think, uh, Hisuian Gudra, well, Hisuian Gudra, Hisuian Zorg V star is standing right now as well. So Zorg is, is a, another like heavy hitter. But that's like all it can do is hit heavy. 
Um, and I think unfortunately for Zorg, its HP is like really low at the 270. If it had a little bit more HP, I actually think it would be good to combo with like Charon's Care. Um, but the problem it kind of runs into in the Lost Zone matchup or the Lost Box matchup is that they can put enough prize cards together that when they get to the late game, they can just go Charizard, Charizard and just KO two Zoroks back to back pretty easily. Because that 270, when you're damaging yourself with uh, Gape Jaw Bog to actually be able to do enough damage to KO anything, uh, it just makes it really awkward. Um, but if you're going up against like just Muse and just Kyrams, I actually think Zorok is really, really good. I think it's like favored. It's like the best of the heavy hitters. Like when the heavy hitters go up against each other, Zorok comes out on top. But there's too many non-heavy hitters in the meta yeah. to to kind of do that right now. And your Palkia and Talion matchup is pretty close or, or slightly unfavorable as well because like the custom ca- or the cross switcher, so they can get around your uh, Diancie. But um, yeah, that's kind of the problem. The problem is your like your Lost Box matchup is pretty rough because of Charizard. Like and, you're, and you just have 270 HP and you have damage on yourself already. I wonder if maybe this way that this person played the deck uh, would you know make that better, right? We've got the two Empoleon V in here, four Water Energy, two Melanie. So yeah. they're trying to attack with Empoleon pretty quickly. I actually have not played any games with this list at all yet, um, but they did do pretty well against Lost Box. They lost to one Lost Box. They lost to a Giratina, but then they beat one, two, three, four, five Lost Box decks through the rest of their tournament. Yeah. So yeah, I would say yeah. I mean, the, that definitely would help your Lost Box matchup quite a bit. But I don't know if it's if it's worth it at the expense of your consistency up against those other heavy hitting decks right that's a lot of cards to add that don't allow your zork to attack for big damage right and now that we've seen the evolution of lost box adding you know paths and colognes and stuff um i'm sure those techs will not be as efficient as they uh as they were right the double employment won't just won't be as good anymore something to know too i guess uh worth mentioning is that if you put two basic water energies on your zoark you now cap out at 330 right which lets you oko me with an orcorio in play lets you oko kiram so that's you know not a bad thing either which is not something that most lists could do previously well, no, you had the Halucha. Halucha got you there. For oh, the, for the cure. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's a good point. Halucha's, Never mind. Yeah, yeah. Halucha's the, the homie. Hooks of the one I guess. Yeah, so I was saying, like, Zork wins. I think Zork wins the, the big beatdown battle most of the time. But, yeah, you mean, like, the Lost the lost Walk matchup is rough. Yeah, the Empoleons, like, can help. Yeah, but, yeah, I don't know. If everyone is has, I'm sure some of the, the list they put against didn't have, you know, the Path and the Cologne. But if everyone has Path and Cologne, I think it gets a little bit more difficult. Because you don't need Cologne or Path every single turn. You just need to get going as Lost Box, and then, then you'll usually be fine. But you need to get going initially to begin with. So are we at a point in the meta where it's developed right now where if you're wanting to play a water deck this weekend, be it Curum or Palkia, whatever it may be, um, do you just anticipate the lost boxes having the answers and you don't worry about playing the one Empoleon, the two Empoleon, whatever it might be, uh, and just worry about your consistency first and foremost, or is Empoleon still worth playing? That's a tough question, to be honest. Because I think if you do play Empoleon, you'd want to play... I think most, like I said, I think most lost, lost, bo- most lost boxes will adapt and start to play the paths and the colognes. But I don't know how that fully breaks down yet. I've tested it a little bit so far. Um, and you don't just beat Empoleon. Like, them just opening Empoleon or getting Empoleon on the active turn one is still really, really tough to deal with sometimes. So um, it's something to be tested. I'm sure that's what a lot of people are testing right now is... Um, it definitely seems like you if, there, if the double Empoleon meta is expected, then you need to play Cologne or Path. And then for the Empoleon players, it now becomes, okay, if that just beats us, what is a different way we can beat this deck? Should we just play different decks? Because if we're just losing to Lost Box, if our Empoleons are useless... Uh, then you either need to come up with a new tech, but if you can't, you just need to switch decks, right? Um, so that's what everyone's going to be testing this week, I think, for sure. And I think the Lost Boxes uh, will probably have to keep the Colognes in the path, especially if it doesn't beat it. You know, if that doesn't just auto-win the matchup all of a sudden, you got to keep got to keep them. And then that means also if the Double Empoleon still gives you a decent win percentage against those, even if they got the paths and Colognes, then you kind of just go head-to-head and just see how it goes. And no one really has the advantage at that point, right? And that's what the kind of the evolution of the meta became. No one has an advantage, right? That They got their paths or Colognes, and you got your Double Empoleon, and now we get a fair fight, right? And then one, I guess one last thing we should mention. So two big decks from the last format – that we haven't really talked about and I think are probably going to have a harder time is going to be the Arceus Pikachu uh, or Arceus Beebrel with the the Flying Pikachu, Decidueye, whatever other pieces you want to put in there. 
Uh, and then also Mewtwo v Union. I think both of those decks are kind of going to have a hard time in this current meta. Mewtwo specifically, because Giratina, I mean, doing 280, uh, though you do have to loss zone your energies, uh, is it's a lot for, for Mewtwo to deal with. I mean, we saw in your stream game how dealing with just the 220 every single turn uh, became a little sketchy, right, with the the Zor, or sorry, the, uh, yeah. the Duraludon matchup there. But I don't know, what are your thoughts? As someone who played um uh both of these decks to success what do you where do you think they're at right now with the way the meta has changed with the new set um i think yeah the giratina is tough for me to be union that's really the only thing that's really tough for it though i think out of the new stuff yeah lost box uh, is probably a solid matchup right yeah <laughs> very much 12 12 <laughs> um, and then even like mill tank plus path kind of beats kiram as well like even though they have the empoleons you just play more stadiums like you could go up to like three mill tank four path if you wanted to to beat that matchup uh to deal with empoleon in general so you have that but some decks playing drapion with gates and then Giratina. I think for Peoria, Mewtwo v Union's got to sit it out and see where the meta goes after Peoria. Um, it could make a comeback, possibly, but I think it currently has to sit out the meta. Yeah, because, like, Gates plus Drapion, it's, like, impossible to beat. Drapion with any form of, like, extra energy to it is, like, not good. You can't beat it. Um, I mean, and I, I guess like also, a... like, Giratina having lost vacuum, right, uh, yeah, yeah. is really bad. Because they just go yeah. lost vacuum away the Parasol and then kill you with Star Requiem. Well, you have your ability. You have your ability that stops. Oh, you're attack. right. Yeah, so they would have to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they they would have to play path to begin with. Yeah. So, uh, but them doing 280 is too much to deal with anyway. So you just can't beat 280, and Mill Tank doesn't stop them because they have Cramorant. So yeah, yeah. Gear is not really beatable. Uh, Drapion with energy. They, they sometimes you can just build up enough energy on a Drapion to swing anyways, and that's not beatable. So there's just too many things that I think are too tough for that. But I think, well, I mean, Arceus B Barrel. I think Arceus B Barrel is kind of the deck, and then you evolve it based on what the meta is, and that's what. Arcus Garatina is it usually has B barrel in it, right? Sure. So sure. Arcus B barrel has just become Arcus B barrel Garatina. That deck we haven't seen a ton of success from it. There's been there was at Singapore, but um since then we haven't seen anything from it really. And I haven't played with the deck myself, so I don't really have too strong of an opinion. But I think Arcus B barrel will probably survive in some form and it could be Garatina, but definitely feels like a deck where the meta needs to stabilize a little bit because you really want to hone in on what are you playing this what are you playing those two cards with and the past we saw with just crawl back Max because that's all you really needed uh and then we it evolves to the flying pikachu and now it's giratina currently but i think it could it'll definitely be good it just depends we just need to figure out what's the best partner for it i think the meta is a little bit too open to make that call yet i do have to say i love the fact that this new set has had such a big impact on the meta uh, like it, it this is my favorite time my, my favorite part of Pokemon is the new sets and the innovation and the, the new decks that come up and also the old decks that have new life breathed into them. Uh, but just looking at the limitless decks, like the most played decks in tournaments over the... And part of this is probably the shiny new thing, right? Um, but Mew and Palkia are still up here at four and five. But then the other top seven decks are all brand new archetypes. Lost Zone Box, Giratina... Curum Palkia, and then at four and five, we've got Palkia, Intellion, and Mew, and then six is Hisuian Zoark, seven is Hisuian Gudra, and I think that is just awesome. <laughs> yeah, definitely cool to see so many new decks being good, and I think the biggest thing uh, for sure is none of them feel uh, overpowering, right? Like in the past, it was like, oh, Palkia came out, Palkia, Intellion's broken. Mew came out, Mew's broken. ADP came out, ADP's broken, right? It's like you got this Curum. Lost Box, Giratina, Gudra, Zorak, they all feel like just reasonable Pokemon decks, right? Like Lost Box, I think, feels the strongest out of all of them. Uh, but there has to be, you know, something better than the rest, right? And especially because it is the best new deck, it's going to be the most popular to start with, right? But it doesn't feel overwhelmingly strong, right? So that's really cool to see. So yeah, definitely really cool to see how it feels like a healthy uh, improvement on the meta, for sure. For sure. And I think that is going to wrap the episode up this week thank you so much to everyone for listening for tuning in be sure to leave a like on the youtube video if you enjoyed and please leave us a rating on your favorite podcasting platform it really does help us out so much and it only takes just a second or two if you want to follow along with us you can do that on social media is the easiest way to do it you can follow myself at trainer chip azul is at azul underscore gg and you can also follow the podcast at uncommon underscore energy over on Twitter is really kind of the the main platform for us to uh, to interact with everyone. So thank you all so much for listening. Azul, anything else to add before we close it out? 
Thank, thanks a ton for the support as always. Uh, good luck to anyone going to, I believe Peoria is the only tournament this weekend. I right? think it's so, be the only yes. One. So good luck to anyone going to Peoria. We maybe missed one if possible, but good luck to anyone going to Peoria and we'll catch you all uh, next Tuesday at uh, 7 a.m. Eastern. Peace. Uh, actually, next week will be Wednesday, right? Uh, Wednesday, actually. Yes, Wednesday. <laughs> Confirmed. We will let you guys know ahead of time. We're actually going to drop it uh, a day late. We will be a day late next week. Yeah. Catch you all Wednesday at 7 a.m. Eastern. Then going back to Tuesday after next week. <laughs> See you then. Peace.